Is a PA really in the White House giving medical care directly to the president and the vice president? Yes. Flying on Air Force One with the president or flying on Air Force Two or Marine Two with the vice president? Yes. Are PAs out there scouting out the hospitals and medical centers that will treat the president and the vice president and their families in case of emergencies? Yes, PAs do that as well. Today I have for you an interview with a PA who has done all those things and even more. So stay tuned. Hello. Welcome. Today I have a very special treat. I somehow was able to line up an interview with a most amazing PA. She became a PA at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. She served 23 years in the U.S. Army, including two tours of Iraq. She then became White House Physician Assistant and Tactical Medical Officer to President Obama, then became Director of Medical Operations for the White House Tactical Medical Unit. As if that wasn't enough, she then became Assistant Director of Public Health at the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy. She has now gone on to become founder and president of the Mansouray Foundation. Her name is Saibatu Mansouray, and she has had an incredible career and is still going strong. I'm so thankful and excited to be talking to you. Welcome, Saibatu. Thank you so much, Michelle. Thank you so, so much. I'm so happy to be here, and thank you for the opportunity. So the goal is to let people, and especially PAs, know about the exciting and incredible things we can do as PAs, because... I think a lot of people think when you graduate, you go work family practice or, you know, you go work dermatology or something like that. And that's kind of the mindset that we have, that those are our options. But you have clearly shown that there are lots of different and exciting things that PAs can do. So first of all, um, when you became a PA, did you become a PA through the Army or did you become a PA first and then join the Army? Through the Army. I was enlisted in the Army and then uh, applied to the inter-service physician assistant program. And that's and it's through that is where I got my uh, PA education. And so grateful for it. Best decision. After joining the Army, the Army was the first best decision and being becoming a PA was the second best career decision I've made in my life. And did you know when you went into the Army that you wanted to become a PA? Like, did you go in with that end goal? No, no, because I actually enlisted. I went in as a private. So no, I didn't. I, I'm from Sierra Leone um, originally, and I moved to the States when I was 20. And uh, six months later, I joined the Army. And not really having what I was going to do, I knew in life that I wanted to be in the medical field. Um, but not necessarily, I didn't, I didn't know anything about the PA you know, program back then. So just briefly, why did you want to go into medicine? As I said, I'm from Sierra Leone. I grew up in a country with a very poor medical healthcare system where health was not and still isn't prioritized. And I distinctly remember being in high school where NGOs and international organizations would come to our school to do these health promotion things. And truly the happiness I would get from them coming, multiple things. One, it was the only way that I ever had access to care. I never saw a doctor here, right? So it was the only way I got access to care. And I don't even know if those people were doctors, they're like nurses. We didn't know what they were. We just knew that they were coming with medical supplies. And it was so exciting. The feeling that they gave me is the feeling that I always said, I want to give that to the people. I want when someone sees me, that they have this feeling of, She's going to make things better, right? And if people are looking into where they want to go to PA school, is that would you recommend Army training for, for PAs? Yes, I do recommend it. I think it truly grooms you for so many other positions to be able to, to take them on with confidence and ease. Our education does it, but it adds more when the military you know, right. throws their little curveballs in there as well. So yes, I definitely think that it's a good way to go. Your, your military service is what has led probably to one of the most exciting PA opportunities that I've ever heard about. You were actually a PA in the White House. So can you tell a little bit about how that happens, how you get chosen to to do that, and what was special about when you were chosen? So all services provide PAs, doctors, and nurses to, to the oh, White military House. Service and military service branches, yes. So they all they all do. And um, I remember just getting the call that I should submit my packet to be uh, to, to go through the selection process first, then you get nominated. And I thought, no, 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 this is, I think you called, you called the wrong number. You are meaning to call me. Uh, but what ends up happening, you submit your packet, they have the requirements and the things they're looking for. Then it goes through a screening process at the Pentagon. They look at all of the packets and they kind of say, out of the 15, 20, however many that the Army submitted, 
um, they would say, well, these are these people made the short list. They have now been nominated, right? So now you're officially nominated, which then takes to the next level, means that you can now go and interview. So then you interview against all of the people that they've selected alongside you. And then, um, and then that's how you end up getting selected, right? Even though I had so much doubt going into it, eventually I got over it because I realized that I was, you're sabotaging yourself, right? Someone is selected, someone's watched you, someone's seen the work that you can do. Why are you getting in your way? Because it wasn't my capabilities. It was, I wasn't worried that, oh, I, I'm not a good PA, I can't do that. It was like, well, a woman has never done this before, right? We've had this position for many years. A woman has never been selected for this position. So, so why, of all the women, why'd you call me? And then you <laughs> called the woman who's from one of the poorest countries in the world, group and one of the poorest countries in the world that people haven't even heard of Sierra Leone. It's not, again, so why are you calling me again? You know, so all of these things that you yourself can't control were the insecurities and not the fact that, no, you're good at what you do. That's yeah. why you were called to do it, right? And go for it. And so once I got all of that, you know, out of my head, it was, it was, I was now committed to the cause. Now I was a little too committed at that point when I walked in, I was like, no, no, I can't leave, leave here without knowing that I got this job. <laughs> so, yeah, so I became the first um, uh, uh, female that the army had ever selected to fill that position as an army PA. So um, that, that's, that's, I mean, that's impressive, amazing in itself, because again, thinking that girl who grew up in Sierra Leone, fetching water, carrying water on her head, right? Who walked to school, who had, you know, zero role models of a woman doing anything, right? To be in that position is just up to this day, is surreal to me that I, that I was able to do that. So I'm super, super grateful for that opportunity. That, that is so cool. <laughs> it's such a great story. And I'm so happy for yeah. you that, that, that you got to have that experience. Yeah. So you said that there's a, a PA that gets sent from every branch in the military. So how many PAs mm -hmm. get sent? And is it per is it per year or is it per administration? No, it's a it's a three year assignment in in a year time frame three or three or four per service. We're all well not sent together because it's a rotational thing, right? Okay. It's apolitical, so it's nothing to do with administration. So when okay. President Obama left and then President Trump came in, if you were still within your three year window, you continue to serve. It changes nothing okay. for you. So so that's the good part. We are we have nothing to do with politics. We're focused on just healthcare. So when you serve in the White House, you're part of the... The White House Medical Unit. Yes, yes. So the White House, White House Medical Unit is an all-military um, unit and is there to provide 24-7, 365 medical support to the presidents, the vice president, the first and second families, and the staff. We have a clinic also within the Eisenhower Executive Office Building, which is right there on the compound, the complex itself of the White House, where staff and other members that work at the White House uh, and in that building as well get to come and, and, and seek care. We have one at the White House Communication Agency as well. So as you can see, there are a lot of, we need a lot of medical people within right. that staff to support civilians that are there to include the president, the vice president, the first and second families, the secret service. So it's so many people, it's thousands and thousands of people that we end up supporting um, throughout our, our, our tenure there. For all of these people, are you, is it mainly just kind of urgent care? Or are you doing like primary care, you know, treating high blood pressure? Well, it's more, like that? yeah, well, it's, it's, it's urgent care. Um, it's not necessarily primary care because because we rotate out so much, right? So for the president and the vice president, first and second family, it is primary care, right? Because you're sort of dedicated. That continuity will always be there. But for the staff, we always, I mean, they have insurance, right? So you 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 actually have to end up and see your your um, your own provider when we're overseas or when we're traveling. We're there now at your primary because your doctor's not with you, right? So if you're on the road and you have an issue, then yes, we, we try to take care of that on the way, but then we also say, hey, follow up with your provider. But there's so much more that the White House Medical Unit does outside of providing healthcare. Um, and we'll talk about that in just a minute, but what what um, what are the professions that make up the, the medical unit in the White House? So we have doctors, we have nurses, we have PAs, um, and then we have other support staff. So the doctors, we normally, uh, the focus is family practice and emergency medicine providers. And then uh, for the nurses, they are ICU nurses and emergency uh, medicine nurses. And then the PAs, they really focus on PAs with uh, more tactical PAs, trauma medicine PAs, those people that have deployed, people that have demonstrated the medical planning skills and have done, you know, some sort of trauma care in their careers of sorts. So Army PAs are very strong in tactical medicine or trauma medicine, just, just because, you know, wars and all of that, right? Yeah. Not 
discounting the other services. Everybody brought their own thing to the table that they were good at, but predominantly across the board, all PAs that were assigned to the White House had to have some sort of trauma, tactical medicine sort of deployment sort of background that they were bringing to the table because that's our role uh, when it comes to, you're talking about tactical medical officer. The tactical medical officer is only for the PAs, but the doctors never called a TMO. The nurses never called a TMO. It's only the PAs because okay. we are responsible for the planning, the medical contingency planning for, for, for the president, the vice president, their families, and we're the trauma specialists on the team. And our our aid bag, our bag, our medical bag that we carry is strictly trauma focused, right? We're not, we're not walking around with Tylenol and Band-Aids in our bags, right? We're walking around with things that are life-saving, life-saving things, right? And so we have a specific role. We're the ones that pre pre uh, pre advance do surveys on hospitals to make sure they meet the qualifications for the for the for the president, the vice president, uh, the emergency medical service systems, you know, ambulances. Make sure that they have all the equipment, their ATLS, ACLS kind of stuff, uh, uh, level stuff. Uh, so we bring something specific to the table. So on the vice president side, it's a two-man team where a doctor or a PA and then a nurse, right? So the PA serve as solo providers on the on the on the vice president side. Um, and then we also, or they're interchangeable with the doctor, is what I'm trying right. to say, on the on the VP side. While on the president side, it's a three-man team all the time. He has a doctor, a PA, and a nurse. So when the president calls and needs to be seen, we're not talking about a big trauma or anything, but just, you know, he, he calls up and he's got a sore throat or something. Um, it, does the doctor always see the president at that point? Or, or if you're the one on call, do you see the president by yourself mm -hmm. as a PA? Yes. So because remember I said it's 24-7, 365, right? Yeah. So everybody stands duty every single day. One of you are standing duty not only at the White House with the vice with the president, but you're also doing it at the vice president's residence, right? So so there's two people every night that are up, you know, that are that are up okay. 24 hours a day, you know, trying to do that. So yes, as a PA, you go and you, you know, you do your assessment, you you come back down, you you work, you still work with the doctor because the president has a a physician that that is his physician, right? So the, it's a physician to the presence. An actual position is a title. That's not a rotating position. That is that person's actual job solely is to provide. The, they're the primary care manager for the president, right? That is their job. And so everything that you're going to do for the president, you better run that by the doctor because okay. there are things that you may not be privy to, right? They just may be right. things again, you know, security reasons. You may not. So you call this, this doc and say, this is what is, this is what's going on. This is what I think is the issue. Um, this is what I want to prescribe. If he knows something more, he would say, go with this. I'm used to giving him this or sounds good. Have a good night. Please do not call me again, right? You're a qualified <laughs> PA. You can go manage it yourself, right? So, but we definitely try to make sure because this is the president of the United States. This has nothing to do with doubting your skills as a provider, but it's also, there's so many layers to, he's the president, right? There's so many layers to it. And you wanna make sure that you have a doctor, right? Right there to verify, triple verify, quadruple verify that, hey, this pill that I'm about to give, are you, are you really sure? Are you sure? Yeah, yes, yes, I'm sure. Okay, great. And then you, you kind of sort of, you sort of go for, you go for it. But we're interested that the, the president, He's in trust, he entrusts the PAs as he does the doctors, right? The unit entrusts you as a PA to be able to manage it. They wouldn't put you to stand duty, at, you know, in the middle of the night, knowing that you're incapable to provide health care to the, to the president or the vice president, right? right. So, but right. nonetheless, we still make sure that we give that respect to the doctor to say, you know, this is really your patient, right, that right. I'm seeing. And this is what I think it is. So, um, and, and we've yet to have, you know, that I, said, I know of, where the doctor and the PA disagreed. Because okay. we're trained to do this stuff, right? We're qualified to do okay. it. You just want to make sure you have a backup, you know, someone else's name is on that list that say, hey, I also spoke to this person <laughs> when it comes down to it, <laughs> right? Yeah, so, because, yeah. you know, there is that extra layer that this, like you said, this is the president yeah. of the United States. You do not want to make any mistakes. And no. and your your records are not just in some EMR somewhere. They're, they're official like yes. national documents, right? <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. All of a sudden, you didn't know he has a salt or allergy, and here you are trying to give up. You're like, I didn't know that. Yeah, you know, this yeah. is all these things, right? So I'm going to call the doctor just to make sure at the right. end of the day. And there's a reporting system, too. The fact that he called you, it also starts a chain of calls, you know, because, right. again, it's the president of the United States. So it's not just his health care. There are other things that have to come in place as well, because what's going on with the president? Is he okay? Is he fit to 
continue to be a president, right? So there's all these things that are happening while you're trying to, I just want to give him his talent all, please stop calling me. <laughs> 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 yeah, you know, so there's a reporting system if you if you ever, you know, engage, right. in, you know, engage him in, in healthcare, yes. Is there anything that changes with how you practice medicine? Well, it, it changes to a, to a degree, right? We, we never still want to escalate the, the, you know, the treatment plan quicker than it should be. You know, you don't want to go straight to antibiotics just because he's saying, you know, I, I, right. I have a sore throat. And, but you also have to keep in mind, there's a fine balance between, but it's also the president of the United States. I can't have him sound hoarse. I can't have him sound it, you know, not looking his best. He has to be on camera. So there's that fine balance of treating you appropriately but also ensuring that you're at your best, right? And this is where you and the doctor sort of work hand in hand. And, and I've also noticed that most of these people are not necessarily calling you and say, please send me a Z pack, right? They, they're not necessarily saying that. They just want to feel better. So if you came in and said, no, you know, Mr. President, let's do, you know, warm salt water gargle and let's see what that looks like for two days and add this and add this, you know, they, they take that, right? They understand that they're also human and sometimes you need to rest. And, then, you know, so, so it's a fine balance. You don't always want to exaggerate or, or, or as I said, escalate the treatment straight to antibiotics because he's still an individual regardless, right? And, and right. whatever, you know, you know, antibiotic resistance that we're creating as we're preaching not to do it to other people, we right. also should be putting that on the president, right? <laughs> and so, so that's where, you know, and it was one thing that we, a doctor used to always say when we would go out to do our um, scout out hospitals for them. The, the doctor would say to me, one of them is one of my mentors, he would always say, we don't want the fancy hospital. I want you to go pick the fancy hospital. I want the hospital where the, the drunkard goes, the one that gets shot, you know, the one that sees the most trauma, right? I know you're walking in, it smells like, you know, urine and there's like, there's all this stuff hanging out outside the door, but that's okay. That's okay. Because I know that they're going to save his life. So yeah, so it's, yeah. it's a very interesting thing because everybody thinks it has to be the best place that you need to take him to, but no, you want to take him where you know that he's going to get the best quality of care. That's where you want to get into, right? So, and treating them is the same way. What am I going to give them that's not going to create another chain of, you know, reaction just because I want to get him as well as quickly as possible, right? A lot of prevention, right? Knowing that the week, you know, looking at his schedule, knowing that this week's going to be a lot of talking, his doctor, that, that's his primary care manager, his doctor starts to, pre you know, prevention is better than cure. Let's start preventing now. Let's start the, the warm salt water gargles. Let's start the the hot tea and the lemon. Let's start, you know, sucking on typical. Let's start all of these things now, right? So that when that time comes, at least you're not starting at zero, right? You're yeah. kind of halfway there. And then we sort of we sort of take it from there. Yeah. So you actually treated President Obama um, and you got to know them as people, right? The the families and, and the people that work in the White House. Um, that must have been a, a whole nother incredible side to to this job. Yes, um, incredible as in like scary. <laughs> yes, well, yes, yes. you tell me, I'm I'm fishing this because I have no idea what it would be like. <laughs> no, no. How did I they mean, How did they treat is, you, and and what kind of interactions did you have? Yeah, no, it's 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 surreal. Like right? some people will stand duty, um, you know, will be on call, call it that, for you know the whole year, you know, two years, and never get a call, right? And then there'll be one person who gets a call and it like it is it is the highlight it's the highlight like oh my gosh she just called me but at the same time oh my gosh she just called me right <laughs> <laughs> so i'm excited that i get to finally i get to go do this thing right i'm not behind the scenes but then at the same time it's like oh my god why did you have to call the day that i'm working i don't even know what you have going on to so you're going through your 50 million algorithms in your head of what you think it is you have no idea right because he's not telling you what he's just like hey doc can you come up and, and, and see me real quick right because everybody's doc to him right he doesn't have time to memorize you know right. 50 something people's names right other than his primary care manager so you know so here we are you know you're you're running up the stairs and you're thinking oh my what, what is this going to be when i have to be am i appropriately dressed you know even though we're in a suit all the time but am i like everything's put together do i have all my stuff do i have you know I have the phone number to the doc i mean you're just going through your own little checklist right of things right. that i need to make sure is happening right and you get in there and then to separate yourself from that he's the president right and and that that sort of like um you know you see a celebrity sort of feeling like separate that like you're here to work lady you do not have time to, to take in the fact that you're standing in front of president obama you're here to right. work right but there is still that part that 
oh my God, this is President Obama, right? <laughs> so <laughs> it's all that's happening in your head, right? And just as and you're taking in the environment at the same time, because you're everything is happening so quickly, right? You're okay. looking at the family dynamic and well, the wife is here, the kid's here, he's there, you know, and it's just like, oh my God, there's just so much happening right now. Don't, don't. Stay cool, stay cool, stay calm. You got this about to be out. You got it, you got it, you know. You can do this, you can do this, right? <laughs> and there's something that, it's like these voices in your head. All of a sudden, you feel like you're uh, schizophrenic, right? <laughs> like you hear voices in your head telling you, you can do it. Come on, come on, girl. <laughs> you can do it. <laughs> you can do it. You're here for a reason. You're a Saibatsu Mansare. They selected you for, like, it's like you're cheerleading yourself in your head. It's like, what is going on? This is so crazy. And then you go in and it's like the most, you know, again, because they are, they are healthy people, right? I mean, it's, they're healthy people. So when they're calling you, it's really not the worst of scenarios, but in your head, as the trauma person on the team, right. you're automatically thinking He's in cardiac like, arrest. He's <laughs> got a oh leg cut off. <laughs> Should I bring the AED with me? What do I do, right? <laughs> exactly. Because that's where you're, you're sort of trained like that. I'm just thinking of, I have to save his life and save his life. You know, so you're thinking that, no, he just may have a headache, you know? Right. He may just want the Tylenol. He, it may be, you know, just the most, it's a small thing, but we are always prepared for yeah. the worst, right? Because yeah. our job is to ensure that the president of the United States is always in the best of health, always, right? Continuity of government. He is the president of the United States, right? So, so you 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 go you you aim a little too high on your fear factor of what's going on with them, and then you go there and it's like, oh, it was just that. Okay, okay, <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take it. Let me calm the cheerleaders in my head down. Calm down. It's okay. This is easy. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, the interaction is good. And the respect that they have for us, it's very important because people don't understand that it, it, even though it's the president, it's the first lady, their children, the respect that they have for staff is unbelievable, right? They don't treat you they don't look down upon you. They don't, and, and we're military as well, right? They have right. utmost respect, number one, for the military service that you have. They respect the fact that you're here. I'm calling you at 2 a.m. You're traveling the world, leaving your family in support of me. You know, so they are appreciative. They're kind. They will, I mean, they will say hi to you in the hallway before you would say hi to them, right? You're right. trying to get out of their way. And they're <laughs> looking, they're like, hey, doc, how's it going? You're thinking, please don't. Please don't remember me. I don't. I don't know if whatever I did the last time worked. Then it's like, and then he'll, he'll say it. He will say it. Like no, hey, thank you for what you did yesterday. I feel so much better. And that feeling is such a good feeling uh, in itself, right? Yeah. And and especially on the vice president, you see that a lot on the vice president side. Uh, you know, because the president has a lot going on, but he right. will acknowledge president. President Obama definitely would acknowledge the VP. I mean, he's the one also seeking out. What's up, Doc? How are you going? Yeah, how are you doing? How's your family? You know, very engaged. The Vice President Biden, Vice President Pence, very, very engaging on that personal level. Like, how are the kids doing? How's your family? And it does make you feel, you know, it makes you even want to work harder, right? This yeah. person actually knows me, you know? So it's, it's a good family, so it's a family environment. So getting back to what you were talking about with the tactical medical officer position, which you said specifically is the PA. So the PAs are the ones that are responsible for, um, I'm just kind of summarizing what you said to make sure I understood it correctly, is that you come up with the, the plan. If something were to happen to the president, the vice president, you know, whether it's in Washington, D.C. or another city in the United States or somewhere around the world, you have to, in advance of their travel, you have to know exactly what the plan, what ambulances you're using, if you need an air ambulance, what the hospitals the best hospital, mm -hmm. like you were saying. Yeah, definitely. There's so much that goes into it. We, we closely collaborate with numerous support entities so that everybody's on the same page, right? So we have seamless communications on what's going to happen, resuscitation plan, evacuation plan for all potential me medical scenarios. And I say, you have to think of every single thing from, I mean, trip hazard, right? And and, and work well with the Secret Service on that because they also have responsibility to, to make sure he's a lot, right? We also provide in-flight medical care on all aircrafts. Um, so you've been on, on Air Force, Force One? We've been on Air Force One and oh, we've been so on, cool. <laughs> I've also been Air Force Two and Marine Two. You do a lot of the PS travel more on Air Force Two and Marine Two because on the president side, you're advancing it, right? So you're in advance, right. you arrive, you receive him. On the on the um, VP side, you are his primary provider on the plane 
Okay. If a doctor is also available, so you kind of go back and forth, right? right? So the present side, we do the advance, as you said, developing the medical contingency plan. Hospital one is the primary hospital. Hospital two is a secondary hospital that we'll go to, right? Because anything can happen. And it may be where we are in, in, in the city makes this hospital more of a primary hospital than this hospital. Because I don't, you know, because time is of the essence, right? So we, we do a lot of that. We do conduct um, <clears throat> the advanced pre-hospital and hospital surveys and local emergency medical systems around the world. So it doesn't matter if he's going to Ohio or if he's going to Singapore, it doesn't matter where he's going. We always have to have a hospital plan for him, um, the emergency medical system plan, a CBRNE plan. You know, you have to have a plan for every single thing that could potentially happen along the way. And so there's a lot of thinking, right? You gotta make sure your stuff is locked in tight and be able to justify that you selected that particular hospital, especially when you're in a, a city that has a lot of hospitals, right? Even in, in Washington, D.C., for example, right? We have GW and you have MedStar and um, and then you have Baltimore Shop Trauma, right? Depending on where he's at, you have to figure out Johns Hopkins. You have to figure out well, which one of the two are the better ones for us to go to. They both are level one hospitals, right? right. Well, one is better than the other for certain things. And then you can't get into that here. But right. there's some that you will prefer one over the other for whatever reason, right? And then if there's a big, you know, thing going on in the city, where do you want to take him? Because everybody's going to go to that same hospital, right? So right. then you have to come up with a plan to make sure that he's not caught up in all of that. So there's yeah. a lot of contingency. You just, it, that's why having that operational planning background, which is what the army right. instills in us as PAs. I mean, because that's what we do when we get ready to deploy, right? When we are planning any medical, any mission that the military is planning, there's a medical plan to it as well. So you already are into that medical planning sort of mindset. So the army PAs do fantastic. All PAs do well, but the army PAs, it's just, it's like a breeze for us because it's something that we're so used to doing anyway. Right. Just, we don't do it for the president, but you're doing it for soldiers, right? These are the, the sons and daughters of America, you know, American parents. So you care about them just as you would uh, the president of the United States. So right. we, we kind of do that. Then you became the director of medical operations for the, the White House medical unit. What did that entail? Mm -hmm. So when, when I originally talked about doing the advanced work, right, PAs go out and do the advanced work, the director of operations, they do the initial um, plan. I've selected this hospital based on this information that I have. Now I'm going to send you out as a PA to go verify that this hospital I've selected is up to date. You're going to update the survey, and then you're going to keep on with the plan. You now develop the rest of the plan. So as the director of medical operations, you're overseeing all of the medical operations within the, the unit, not just for the president, but the vice president, the uh, the first and second family, you're responsible for all four. When you're a PA, it's only that one test I gave you, oh, the president is going to Ohio. So you go focus on the president in Ohio. As the director of medical operations, if the president is going to Ohio, the vice president is going to Texas, the first lady is going here, the second lady is going here, the kids are going here, you're responsible to figure out all of that, right? Oh. So. You lead and you manage all of the, you know, at the time when I was there, I think about 56, we had PAs, nurses, and physicians, right? So you kind of manage all of them. We also liaise with um, governmental agencies and host nation, right? So if we're going, if I know that the president's going to go to another country, then we're also working with host nation now, their healthcare system as well. We're working with governmental agencies within the United States, so Department of State, Department of Defense, you know, depending on where we're going, who else needs to come along, you develop comprehensive, right, medical contingency right. plans. And so now you're the one doing the advanced work for the overseas trips, right? Locally is, you know, in the, in the United States, the PAs go out and do that. As director of medical operations, if they're traveling overseas, you and the staff, meaning the VP staff or the president staff, you travel with them, to include the Secret Service. And so you come up with a comprehensive medical contingency plan. You bring that back, right? Then you turn it over to the PA that you've now selected who's going to go to that country and do the advanced work again, oh, right? Okay. So your pre-advanced and survey, pre-advanced surveys on medical facilities, you do, uh, and their host nation emergency medical systems, you ensure that there's access to the best resources, the hospitals, the physicians, the medical evacuation assets, logistics in case of emergency. Um, you also, you know, you have to keep, your plan has to keep changing sometimes based on the health of the, the president, the vice president, or the country itself. So you're also looking at neighboring countries as well, not just where he's at. You know, maybe this country can't support certain things. And so what is my plan going to be? There's never a, this is all we have, right. Mr. President, right? That's not a plan. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't just end there, right? So right. then you're the primary liaison as the director of medical operations. You're the primary liaison 
with the Secret Service, right? With the president and the vice president's operational cells, right? With the White House staff, the State Department, like I said, Department of Defense, uh, on all medical policy and plans in support of the president and the vice president. You also ensure that the PAs, the nurses, and the docs, that they maintain their training or you create training opportunities for them. We focus on, you know, getting your CBRNE training stuff done, other forms of trauma simulation training, ATLS, ACLS, BLS, so many intubations a year that you have to do practice. So we make sure that you are prepared because it's there's zero tolerance for failure at any task that's given to you in support of that. So it's a very, very busy role because your phone is ringing. I mean, you're home and all of a sudden what happens in the world? Out of the blue, something right. happens in the world and the president has to go, you know, the death of a head of state, right? He's leaving and the funeral is tomorrow. You know, you always have to be um, ready to go. You know, have to have somebody that's always ready to go that's qualified and then our surveys have to stay updated right so every time someone goes to a country come back the survey has to be updated so if we don't have enough time to send somebody in advance at least the latest one we have is right. a good starting point and right. that person can use that to kind of you know develop it so it's a very it's a very big job and, and and i was also the first woman to fill that position it's always been men filling that position as well so i was the first female to be able to fill that position as director of medical uh, operations Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> so yes. how many years total? As a PA, as, as a PA, let me correct yeah. that because okay. maybe, yeah, as a PA, go ahead. Okay. So how many years did you work in the White House altogether? So 10 years total, but in the military side, um, it was, uh, I think six years, yeah, six years on the military side and then four years as a civilian because I, I, I did the PA tactical medical officer thing uh, with the with the president, then the director of medical operations, and then veered off into a non medical role and into doing uh, military aid for the vice president, which has nothing to do with you know clinical stuff. It's more planning, uh, planning stuff more than anything else. I can imagine the the pressure must have been intense working in the White House, and there um, it wasn't wasn't like I had pictured that you would kind of just be sitting there, you know, twilling your thumbs until the president called or the vice president. I did not realize you had such a, you know, that you're taking care of so many people and, and then so much with the tactical stuff. So it sounds like a very busy and pressure filled oh, job, yeah. but, but yeah. ultimately probably one of the most amazing experiences that someone could have, I would assume <laughs> as a PA. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. You're tired, but it's like, it's that worth it. It's just, it was worth it. It was like, we're like, yeah, I, I, it was worth the tired. I'll take it. <laughs> I'll take it any day. <laughs> yeah. Just to, I feel be down. I feel be down, but it's, it was worth the be yeah. down. I'll take it. <laughs> yeah. And, and I, I love your story because um, I think a lot of times we count ourselves out that we're not special enough or we're not the right type of person to pursue something that is so cool. And uh, I get from you just the encouragement that if there's something that that sounds amazing that you you know want to try, obviously you have to be you have to make sure you've done the work and are prepared, you know, or prepare yourself, yeah. work on preparing yourself to to do that. But just to yeah, to go yeah. for it, right? Because you never know where you're going to end up in life. It's very true. You know, I'd rather be prepared for something that I don't I haven't been called for yet than to be called for it and I'm not prepared, right? And I, and I think, because it's important that as PAs, um, but, but anybody in, in general, you, you know, someone's always watching you. Someone's watching your work ethic. Someone's watching the quality. Someone's watching how you are moving and, and they, they're watching what you're doing. And, 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 and you'll be surprised how somebody out of the blue nominates you for a position that you, you're not even thinking, you are doubting yourself. And that person is like, woman, I've been watching your career for, you know, 10 years or five years and you have been stellar. You are the person for this, right? So yeah. SPAs always think as, as people, period, we should always be thinking someone's watching, right? We should always strive to be the better version of ourselves. Don't limit yourself to just this thing. This is all I can do because there's not, that's not it. You can do so much more if you allow yourself to believe that you can do so much more. You're not just a clinical person. Our education, right, as, a, as PAs prepares us to be more than just clinicians. That, that's the, the joys of being a PA. And I was every time I give these talks, I tell people that you, you can be so much more because we are prepared for that. The, the responsibilities of the leadership the role that you take as a PA when you go into your clinic. So you become a critical thinker and, and an innovator 
that's something you take into an, another job that has nothing to do with clinical, you know, or, or with medicine, right? Your people and organizational skills, your effective communication, right? Those are all things. And the need that we have as PAs to improve in our in our small little world, that translates to impacting globally. If you're a PA that wanted to do something like I'm doing now, right? Here I am doing NGO, you know, work. It's because I know that I have all the skill sets based on what I've learned from PA school and then combine that with the military, the visionary stuff that they give us, right? So there's so much. PAs are dynamic, right? We're dynamic in the sense that we're trainable, we're adaptable. We always want to be the best in the group, right? So that, that in itself prepares you to take on tasks that are outside of medicine. I live it every day and, and I'm so confident that I can go on and take on anything. So yeah. yes, we as PAs, we can do it. <laughs> Wow, such great stuff, right? And this interview isn't anywhere close to being finished. She still has a lot more to tell us, but in the interest of time, I am dividing this interview up into two parts. So in that part two, she talks more about her roles of working with the vice president, working on public health policy and legislation, working with the NBA, and then also starting her own foundation. I hope that you have found this video as inspirational as I have. She has shown it doesn't matter where you come from, if you're a man or a woman, what race you are, if you have the ability and you have the knowledge and you have the belief in yourself, you can do just about anything in this world. So thank you again so much to Saibatu and I will see you all in part two.